evening and by the time we are done and you're going home the sun might be down but um, enjoy it because here in a few more months it's not going to be so you're going to be getting to nighttime church and it's going to be nighttime okay so sunday evening church will really be in the evening but i'm glad you're here right now enjoying the sunlight and uh, we're going to have a choir song for you i pray that you would enjoy it and be blessed by it and while you're waiting and while we're singing, grab your songbooks out and turn to number 680. It still is the day before Independence Day. We'll sing another patriotic song. So number 680, we'll sing that right after the choir is done singing. And uh, hopefully this song will be a blessing to you. While walking down a memory lane of past so long ago, old Satan came right by my side, making me feel low. He brought up thoughts of hurt and pain when I had gone astray. He wanted to discourage me as I walked along my way. He said, you're undeserving, cause I know where you've been. I have a record of your life when you were bound by sin. I know your darkest secrets that you would never tell. What makes you think you don't deserve a place with me in hell? Well, I heard the old accuser, and this was my reply. You're right for all those things I've done. I sure deserve to die. My righteousness is filthy rags, my goodness is unclean. There's only one thing I can say to what you said to me. It's under the blood, oh praise his dear name. I'm not what I used to be, my life's been changed. stand up and turn to number 680 that was a blessing that was a blessing number 680 my country tis of thee we'll sing all four verses if y'all would please number 680 
No, not when you're there, okay? Like this. Only a few, y'all. I'll just pretend you're there. Okay, how about this? All right, all four verses, number 680, My Country, Tis of Thee. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Thy native country, the land of the noble free, thy name I love. I love thy rocks and rills, thy woods and templed hills. My heart with rapture thrills like that above. Let music swell the breeze and ring from all the trees, sweet freedom song. Let mortal tongues awake, let all that breathe partake, let rocks their silence break, the sound prolong. All right, after the fourth verse, I'll let you go out and shake some hands because I know we already had some, some uh, really, really long naps, some strong naps, some deep naps. You might have forgot who was here. So I'll let you reintroduce yourselves. And uh, I had a nap too, so it's all right. <laughs> so on that fourth verse, here we go. Our fathers, God, to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God our King. Amen. Y'all shake hands.
All right, everybody, let's come back to your seats. We'll sing that first verse again, number 680, My Country Tis of Thee. All right, 680, so come and grab your songbooks. Hopefully you remember where you put it and turn to number 680. We'll get that first verse out, and uh, then we'll move on with the rest of our service. Here we go, number 680, that first verse. <clears throat> My country tis of the sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. All right, you may be seated. Like I said, I do appreciate y'all coming out on this day, and uh, you're really showing more importance than what the world is considering. The world is considering going out and finding what town and what area and what field they're going to blow up a bunch of gunpowder over their heads and thinking that's more important than going to church. I appreciate that. It's not even the fourth today. Okay, you can do that tomorrow. But uh, some people are going out, and that's what they're doing right now, is putting more of an emphasis over a uh, pyrotechnic display than strengthening your family and strengthening your life for eternal purposes. So you made the right choice, right? Maybe not so much as listening to me, but listen to the Word of God, okay? Um, if pastor were up here, I'd say a skilled person would be up here. Uh, I appreciate him letting me have the chance to get up here and preach to y'all. So let me tell you what's going to happen tonight. We're going to have a short message, and after the message, and uh, hey, caveat here. If you don't leave with that, uh, if you don't leave with something that God gave you, then sit back down. We'll do it again. Cool. Okay. But after the message is over, we're going to have a few watermelon things. If you signed up on the paper outside for a watermelon eating contest, he'll give you the gist of what we're going to do with that, because that's going to be the very next immediate thing following the service. We're going to go out there under the carport. There's going to be a line of tables with a bunch of cut up watermelon on the tables. We're going to give everyone at max half a watermelon. And you're going to say, wow, half a watermelon, that's a lot. Well, the watermelon's only about yay big. Okay, little seedless watermelon. You have about two minutes. If you can power through a whole watermelon, then, hey, more power to you. But if no one does finish the, the whole half a watermelon in two minutes, we'll see who eats the most, and we'll declare them most hydrated, okay, or champion. Um, after that, we'll have, like I said, anyone above the age of 10, that is willing to go out and see if they can work in teams and blow up a watermelon. If you've never seen a watermelon blow up, other than Gallagher style, then uh, it's pretty cool. We're going to relay race around a watermelon with rubber bands, and as you place the rubber bands on this watermelon, it'll slowly constrict this watermelon down until it pops off the top. And it can be a pretty impressive finish when that thing goes off. So the reason why I say um, 10 and older is we don't want kids to, one, get run over because it gets pretty fast when this happens. And two, we don't want to end someone's life too early. No, I'm just kidding. So, uh, I trust that older people will be able to uh, react to the watermelon blowing up, and younger people I don't want to have to uh, worry about and worry about them getting hurt. So 10 and older can do that. And when all this is going on, we'll have watermelon uh, ready to be served. You can go out there and grab some watermelon to snack on. After those two things are over, we'll have watermelon games, some uh, watermelon, uh, I think there's like three different games out there. Pin the seed on the watermelon, uh, throw a hoop on a watermelon. So some stuff for the younger kids, uh, roll a watermelon around some cones. So there's a lot of things that uh, for all ages. So this is family fun night. We wanted things for everyone to be able to do. So, I'm sorry, Jojo, you can't blow up a watermelon. But you can race and see who's the fastest watermelon roller. You, you, you can eat. Yes, you can do that. Excellent. Hey, he did the right thing. He signed up. We'll take you if you don't sign up. But we, do, we definitely wanted you to sign up so we know how much watermelon to cut up. All right. So that's everything going on tonight. Would you all stand with me one more time? We'll have the offering after this song. Let's turn to number 347. I don't know if we've sung this in a while. But I do like this song, number 347. <clears throat> All right, we'll sing the first, second, and the third verse on this song, number 347. And after the last verse that we're singing, first, second, and fourth verse, sorry, we'll have the offering. Okay, here we go. On that first verse, oh, happy day. 
Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. Well, may this glowing heart rejoice and tell its raptures all abroad. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray, and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Tis done the great, I'm sorry, Oh, happy bond that seals my vows To him who merits all my love Let cheerful anthems fill this house While to that sacred shrine I move Happy day, happy day When Jesus washed my sins away He taught me how to watch and pray And live rejoicing every day Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Now rest my long divided heart, fixed on this blissful scent to rest. Nor ever from my Lord depart, with Him of every good possessed. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray, and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Sir. Amen. Okay, sure. Man, I was about to join in with y'all, but I would have got the words wrong, so <laughs> thank you. All right, who's going to pray? All right, go ahead. Amen. All right, maybe seated. Amen. Thank you, Miss Jayla. If you don't think you're blessed when you have so many people that know how to play the piano, then something's wrong. 
And uh, I appreciate hearing the piano going on and uh, sometimes even at 10 o'clock at night, even when you don't think the piano's going. But I appreciate it because that means kids are doing things that they love to do and uh, they are getting after it, learning how to play an instrument and to honor God that way. So uh, I'm not going to tell them to stop. I hope y'all don't either. Um, so thank you for that. That was good. Where you at? There you are. Thank you. <laughs> Let's stand up one more time. We're going to sing number 352, and then we'll get started this evening. Number 352, He Touched Me. Number 352, and hopefully God touched your heart at some point in time in your life. And like they said, cleansed your black heart white. 352, He Touched Me. We'll sing all the verses of this song. Here we go. Shackled by a heavy burden Neath the load of guilt and shame Then the hand of Jesus touched me And now I am no longer the same He touched me Oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. Since I met this blessed Savior, I will never cease to praise Him. I'll shout it while eternity rolls. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, good job. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. All right, man, you may be seated. Let's get your Bibles out. All right, we're going to go to the book of Ephesians and continue on. We have a, a series of messages on the family, three family messages that we've been trying to get through. The first one, we were talking about what a family is supposed to do, what a family is supposed to be like in Christ. And anyone remember, what are some things that a family should do that we went over last month? What are some things a family should do together? We went over at least three of these last time we were preaching, worship. last time we were here. Worship. Family should worship together. Exactly. Family should worship together. That is the first institution that God created is the family, and families should worship the Lord together. Now, this should not be the only place your family worships the Lord. It should happen at all times. And Deuteronomy tells us we're supposed to teach about the, about the Lord when we're rising up, when you're waking up in the morning, when you're going down at night, when you're going to bed when you're going throughout your day, when you're driving to work, when you're driving to school, all those times you're supposed to try to take opportunity to worship together. Now, what's another thing that a family is supposed to do? Okay, we had worship and pray together, all right? A family that prays together stays together. I just made that up, but it is true though, okay? You can write it down, you can put it on a picture, whatever you want to do, but it is true. A family that prays together stays together. Why is that? Because they are establishing and maintaining communication with the Lord. So if you don't pray together and you don't worship together, then something is wrong with your family's as a whole relationship with the Lord. Your communication chain is broken. Okay? Anyone else remember what else we're supposed to do? Sing. Yep. Sing together, work together, serve together. There's all kinds of things that a family is supposed to do and God made it evident in just the very first family that he created. Look at Adam and Eve. He didn't put them in a resort to do nothing. I mean, how many people like to go on a cruise? I've never been on a cruise. I may or may not go sometime in my lifetime. You're like, yes, Katie is like, I want to go on a cruise. I haven't ever gone on one before. 
Oh, you're saying, yes, I've never gone on one? I'm doing I agree. Oh. In my school, uh, when... <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> oh, I understand, though, Katie, I understand. Do you work on a cruise? I mean, if you're employed by the cruise ship or the cruise line, maybe you work on a cruise. But no, you're on vacation. Why work? God didn't put Adam and Eve in a vacation land. He put Adam and Eve in a beautiful land. He put Adam and Eve in a God-created land that was good for everybody that had exactly what they needed, but he made it so that they needed to work. The Bible tells us if uh, we don't work, we don't eat. And that's something. What if they instituted that rule here in Newport News in Yorktown? If you don't work, you don't eat. Man, all those fast food restaurants out there, they wouldn't have any help wanted signs. You know, they were offering $500 bonus to sign on a Dairy Queen. Complete training, get $500. I'm going to pick up a second job. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's important the things that we know that God teaches us uh, for our families. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into our second bit of what we're going to talk about this evening. Here we go. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you so much that you've given us in your word exactly what you want us to do as a family. Thank you for this church family, and thank you for the uh, families that are represented here tonight. Thank you so much for parents and for children and for people that are just trying to minister to um, those near to them, Lord. And I pray that you please help us to learn how to do that better even tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. There was an article I found by a pastor in Oregon. And uh, this pastor is part of a teeny tiny little town. And when I say teeny tiny, I mean it's teeny tiny. I didn't even know where it was. My wife didn't know where it was. We had to find out where it was by where it was near. And, uh, but we finally found it after we Googled it. But it doesn't matter because this pastor is a pastor of an independent Baptist church. And he wrote about father's influence. Now, I'll pick on fathers a little bit, but everyone has something in here. Men, God has created you to be leaders in the home. And this pastor wrote, talking about a conversation he had with a man in his church. He said that this man told him they were not going to be at church for the next three months because his daughters were going to play sports and the games and practices were on Sundays and Wednesdays. The pastor pleaded with him and <clears throat> said, uh, he and his girls are saved. What else is there? That's the attitude that a lot of people have. They're already saved. They're already going to heaven. What else is there? The pastor pleaded and pleaded and pleaded and uh, said everything that he could think of to keep the man and his family in church, and the man walked out. Girls made it to two more youth meetings, and then they never darkened the door of that church again. The influence that a father has in a family is so important. It is so important. Research shows, now listen to this, we just had Father's Day. Father's Day is the lowest attended holiday for church members across the country, whereas Mother's Day is the third highest attended holiday for church members and second only to Easter and Christmas. So where is our country going if Father's Day, the day for fathers, fathers don't get their families into church. Fathers go and do other things. Most of the time, the way that the father goes is the way that the family goes, and the way that the family goes is the way that the church goes. Right. And I hope you remember that. Fathers, men in the church, the leadership that you have around you, it is on your shoulders. And we're going to get into some scripture here. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll start off there. In Ephesians chapter 5. And that kind of surprised me. Father's Day, the lowest attended out of all the holidays across church membership in America. Father's Day. I would think that's be one of the highest ones. So Ephesians chapter 5, in, starting in verse 23 to 28. We're going to start in verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, 
but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And I'm going to take a stretch and say that if you love your wife as yourself, more than likely you're going to love your children as yourself. And if you love your wife and your children as yourself, guess what? That's love for your whole family. Now let's look at the purpose that Christ had in this passage right here. He gives a comparison. Fathers are in the family as Christ is to the church. Christ is to the head of the church and the father is the head of the family. So why did he do that? What is the correlation here? Why did he highlight Christ and the church and fathers and wives? This passage is not about wives. This is about the responsibility of leading your family in a godly direction. Let's take a look at these verses here in verse number 26 is where I want to point out. Now, this is Christ saying what he was going to do for the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now, what is our purpose? Do we want a clean family before the Lord? If you are in charge of a family unit, if you have influence over your family, do you want your family to stay clean before the Lord? Look at that next verse in number 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now let's take a correlation to the family and husbands or fathers. Fathers, are you trying to see that your house, your family is presented to the Lord without blemish and holy and spotless and clean? That is your intent. That is the intent for fathers in this time and back then, since it's been written here in the New Testament, and back then since Adam and Eve's time. That has been the intent. Leadership, lead in the right direction. Lead towards the Lord. Lead towards the Word. Get your family washed under the Word of the Lord. And I appreciate it all y'all coming here and all y'all being here tonight because there's nothing special about me, but the only thing special is we're cracking open the Bible and getting into the Word of the Lord, and that is what's going to clean your family up. Get your family under the sound of the word. Jesus Christ died and Jesus Christ, uh, his intent was to sanctify his church, to present it clean, to present it pure by the washing of water of the word. And where is your soul going to get washed? Where are you going to get washed? Where the word of God is given. I can bet you that if your church is a TV church, is an online church, is a radio church, and that's the only church that you ever attend, your attendance is going to fall. That's right. Where's your accountability? Where's the person coming alongside you and saying, hey, are we going to go today? Hey, let's go today. How easy, it, how easy is it to turn off that channel, to turn down the radio, to flip something else on when your church is a radio church or a TV church? It is important to be in the house of the Lord. It's important to be a part of the local New Testament church. That's where the word of God is given. That's where God has put a man in that building to give the word of God. Just like husbands, you have a responsibility to lead your wife and your children. God put a man in the house of God and his job is to lead and to give the word of God for your families. Now you go along and you go in that direction, you're in where you need to be. Now, granted, I know what time we live in. I know what age this is. I know that not every family <clears throat> is a, I forget the word, nuclear family? Okay, I forgot it last month too, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> not every family is a nuclear family. Some families don't have a mom, they just have a dad. Some families don't have a dad, they just have a mom. Some families don't have any. Someone's gotta take up that role. As long as someone is taking up that role and pointing in the right direction, God is going to clean your family up. You're willing to subject yourself under the authority of the Word of God. So does it matter that someone has made the choice to not be there? That person's going to have to account for their decision. Praise God for that. But praise God for your decision that you want to be washed under the Word. I'll give you an example. Who's ever seen the laundry monster pile up in your house? You ever seen that dirty pile of laundry pile up behind your door? What are you going to do with it? After a while, it's going to get bigger. It's going to start to smell. 
You're going to run into problems trying to find socks for the morning. All right, there's going to be an issue. Okay, let's take care of it. How do you take care of that? Well, some people say, now this is entirely fictional. I just made this up. But some people would say, well, let's make it look better. Let's fold it up and let's pair the socks up and let's uh, make it look nice and organized right there where it is. We still have a problem. Okay, well, let's make it better. Let's, um, let's get a few more uses out of it. Let's pull the clothes up off the floor and that's getting a little more weird. That still didn't fix the problem that the clothes are dirty. Here's a better one. Let's make it better. Let's, let's make sure that it is going to be taken care of. Let's get a couple of smart devices, a couple of game systems, and put it on the laundry pile so they have things to do. Does that make it any better? The only way you're going to get your dirty clothes clean is to clean them. Go to the laundry room, turn that bright light on, find out where the stains are, and wash it. You get yourself cleaned up because sometimes we don't see the stains on our hearts. We don't see the areas that we are going astray in because we like to live in our world like we are doing the right thing. And we can really, really try to do the right thing, but we're made of flesh. We're made of this stuff. So how do we get clean? We get under the washing of the water of the word. And you take your family to church to get under the washing of water of the word. Now, fathers, how many people like fishing? I like to go fish. How many people like hunting? How many people like sports? How many people like playing board games? How many people like bicycles? How many people like eating? Uh, we have a lot of hobbies, don't we? Can hobbies take you out of the church? What if they're really good hobbies? What if they're hobbies that you can get away and just be in nature and you can praise the Lord by, all by yourself in nature? What if you can get alone in a tree stand and sit there for hours with your Bible and look at your favorite verses and wait for something to pop out and it doesn't matter that it's Sunday church. It doesn't matter that it's Wednesday evening, you should be getting ready for church. Oh, I dare say it does. David talked about that in Psalm 76, verse 4. Someone turn there for me. Psalm 76, verse 4. Let's see who's the fastest on their Bibles. Psalm 76, verse 4. Eli. I didn't even look at this side. <laughs> Thou art more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. Now, if I'm a hunter and I'm like, wow, there's mountains of prey out there. You know what that tells me? I could go out there and I could throw a rock and I hit three deer in the head just by chucking a rock out there. I'm going to be out there every day. But David is saying, thou art more glorious than the mountains of prey. What does that mean? Thou art more glorious than my favorite hobby. Thou art more glorious than my favorite pastime. Thou art more glorious than watching every one of the Super Bowl's quarters. Thou art more glorious than watching that race on Sunday. Thou art more glorious than going bowling, going fishing. Thou art more glorious than sleeping in. Thou art more glorious than my hobbies. Why is that? Because I want to wash my soul under the water of the Word. And as fathers, you should want your family to get washed under the water of the the word. Hebrews 10 25 tells us not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but it says be a part of that local church family. Why is that? Because God is going to use the person that he put in this pulpit to give you the word that you need so that you can get cleaned up. And not only that, there's going to be someone there that's going to encourage you along the way and it's going to challenge you to live closer to Christ. A deer is not going to challenge you to live closer to Christ. It may try your patience, that's about the only thing. It may try your pride. That's about the only thing that it's going to try living spiritually. But when you're in the church house, that is where you're going to hear the word that is going to challenge you and that is going to clean you up. I'll give you a statistic. 3.5% of families come to faith in Christ when a child is saved first. And this is a Lifeway research group. I think I uh, these, did this uh, research several years ago. 3.5% of families come to Christ when a child is saved first. 17% if the wife is saved first. 93% when the husband or the father is saved first. 
That shows the influence that a man, that a father, that a husband has in the home. If the husband says, hey, it's time to go to church. The, the father says, hey, it's time to go to church. They're the decision maker in the home. That's how God designed. That's how he designed things. Let's look at another example, Acts 16. Turn there with me, if you will. Acts 16, story of the Philippian jailer. Here in Acts 16, verses 25 through 34, it tells us, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And you remember this, that jailer thinking that um, if anyone was gone, his life was forfeit. And going on, the keeper of the prison awaked out of sleep. He woke up to this earthquake, hearing the prison doors pop open, the chains fall on the ground. And he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had been fled. But verse 28, Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in. And came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced believing in God with all his house. Now that's not saying Paul or Silas took them and washed their stripes. That's not saying Paul fed them. That's saying the jailer fed them. He got saved and he got into serving. He and his family, he led his family to take them out of the prison. He led his family to serve them by washing their stripes. He led his family to to get baptized, he said, this is what you got to do. The preacher said, you got to do this. The word says we have to do this to be obedient Christians. Now I'm going to get baptized and let's get baptized together since we're all saved. Guess what? The family got baptized. Now what do we do? I'm going to set food in front of these missionaries' uh, plates so that they can eat. We're going to serve the men of God. We are going to serve in our local body of church that we have now. And the husband, the father was leading them. And his house was serving. It's amazing that the influence uh, that a father or a husband has in his home. You can't serve God the right way unless you are saved, as in this story. And that includes your family. Do you know you're going to heaven? Do those that serve alongside you in your house, do you know if they are going to heaven? 1 Corinthians tells us of a man named Stephanus. And I brought this one up last month, too. He served God with his family. He was one of the few people that Paul had baptized. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, here's a few verses in verse number 14 through 16. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say I have baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. The household of Stephanus. I think this was another similar thing. Stephanus said, you know what? The word of God says I'm a sinner. I'm going to get saved, and I'm going to get baptized, and I believe you guys should do this too. And then his family says, you know, I believe what you said. I think that we're sinners too. No, I'm going to get saved, and we're going to get baptized with you because you're leading us in this example. And now they are serving the Lord, Stephanus, and his household. Now, praise the Lord if you are someone that can say you are serving the Lord and your household. Because why is this? You are making a generational service to God. You are making generational Christians. They are seeing a real living example of what a Christian is supposed to be like and that they can follow it. I don't know the statistics right now of how many teenagers are growing up and leaving the household on their own and then leaving the church. I don't know the statistics, but I know it's pretty alarming. And there's books that have been written on this on why a teenager that grows up, they leave church after their freshman year in college, after they get out into the world on their own. And a lot of it boils down to they did not see anything real in their house. They heard the youth pastor. They heard the preacher. They heard the Sunday school teacher. They heard all of this stuff. But when they left, aside from the three hours a week that they're at the church, 
the rest of the 120 whatever hours at the house, they're not seeing anything real. So why should they follow something that they don't see is real? How do you fix that? You show real faith in your life and you let that example lead your family. Again, I'm not faulting anyone if you're part of a family that is not a nuclear family or a traditional family or whatever you want to call it. If you are a Christian, God has called you to be an example to other Christians. And if you are a child that is saved in a family with two unsafe parents, you may be one of those 3.5% families that come to Christ after you get saved. Can you live and be that example as a Christian? Wives and husbands, can you live and be that example as a Christian that would lead your whole family into service? You didn't know that a child, a 12-year-old, could be an example that leads their family, did you? There's plenty of examples in the Bible about that. There's a the little servant that led uh, Naaman to get saved. A little slave girl that believed in the Lord. And one of the greatest people um, at the time had gotten saved. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, bringing up this guy. That is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Can you imagine that, your whole household? Because someone decided to take the leadership role in realizing their need of a Savior and then getting saved realizing their need of getting baptized, realizing their need of serving in the local New Testament body. And now the whole family's coming along. We're in 1 Corinthians 16 and verses 15 and 16. It says that ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus, or Stephanus and Fortunus and Achaicus, or Achaicus for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. Now, not only did he lead his family to serve, he lead his family to sacrifice, and his sacrifice led to supplying the needs of a missionary that no one else was meeting. Now, if you read the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, you'll see that this Corinthians church, this rich church, was supposed to give an offering that never got given. Paul had to come back later and ask him for it. But who was there? Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, they supplied that that was lacking on their part because he decided to show the leadership role in saying, I need to serve God. I need to get saved. I need to get baptized. My household needs to get saved. My household needs to get baptized. My household needs to serve the Lord. My household needs to not watch baseball on Sunday mornings. My household needs to not go to the game or go to the beach or go fishing on Sunday mornings or Sunday nights or Wednesday nights. My household needs to put youth events as a priority. My household needs to put daily devotions as a priority. All those things need to happen. And because that happened, God let Stephanus and a few other gentlemen come and supply that need to the ministry and getting people saved when that need wasn't coming. Bet you didn't know that fathers had that much influence. You look at what's going on in TV. You look at what's going on with movies. You look at what's going on in the media for the past 40 or 50 years. How do they picture fathers? Is Homer Simpson a bright character? You can think of other sim uh, sitcoms. I, I watched a lot of TV when I was a kid. And I think most of the shows that I have watched, the father's a doofus or the father's not there. The father is inept and the mom is the only engaging, the only negotiating and the super stressed out one in the family because no one is helping out. That is totally opposite the way that the Bible says a man in the family should be. Lead by the example that the Lord gives. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Then you may present a clean church and a pure church. Fathers, that you can present a clean family and a pure family. If you're not a, fam if not a father, children, wives, you can help lead your family to be clean and pure. 
by that example you're showing. Let's go forth and make our families closer to Christ today. If we have anything at all that is, um, that is barring us, that is blocking our relationship with the Lord, then I want here and now that we take care of it. Amy, um, can you play something for us, please? I'm going to give it time for invitation right now. I'm not going to pick out a song for us to sing or anything like that, but let's take what we have heard and let's use it. If the Bible has challenged you, this is not me as a speaker. I know I'm not an expert speaker, and that doesn't matter because God doesn't use the wisdom of words. He uses the foolishness of preaching to save those and to correct those and to challenge those. It's preaching that does it. So if the preaching has showed you something that is lacking in your life, now is the time. Now is the time to come and get it right. We have an old-fashioned altar, as pastor says, and this old-fashioned altar can be used more and more and more and more. This old-fashioned altar is not going away. So I'll give you opportunity right now. Let's pray. And if you have something that the Lord has shown you that we can do better on, then let's take care of it. Now, if you can say that serving the Lord is nice and serving the Lord is great and doing what the Bible says is, is awesome, but if you're not truly saved, uh, you can't. You can't in your own power serve the Lord. You have to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside you. So everything that I said doesn't matter except for you need to get saved. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in thy house. If you've not been saved, if you've not been born again, now is the time to do so. You cannot serve the Lord unless you are born again. All you're doing is spinning your wheels and all you're doing is vanity. David said in Psalms, all my righteousnesses are as filthy rags to God. That is everything that I try to do in my own power. I have to serve the Lord through the Holy Spirit. And you can't serve the Lord through the Holy Spirit unless you're saved. I encourage you right now, if you're not saved, come down, talk to us, talk to pastor, all right? Talk to anyone. Don't let a day go by without knowing that you are saved. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us, Lord. Thank you for the challenge in your word, and thank you so much for giving us the um, chance to be with you tonight and to hear how you want us to conduct ourselves in our family, Lord. Lord, thank you for fathers. Thank you for my dad being here. Thank you so much for um, the influence that fathers have in our households, Lord Jesus. And I pray that you would help me. <clears throat> pray that you help me to be more of a godly influence in my house, Lord. Help it to make a generational service to you. Lord, I praise you for the chance to serve you. I praise you for your Holy Spirit. I praise you for salvation. Thank you for it all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Well, I haven't seen my wife poke her head in yet. Uh, and there is Miss Ziamara out there. I was looking for a word for the watermelon. I think we're going to be okay. I want to know, how many people had a dad that took them to church?
I just want to know. Let's raise your hand. How many people had a dad that took you to church? All right. Well, praise the Lord. If you had a dad that took you to church. That's most of us. Okay? That is most of us. We're good? Well, thank the Lord for dads that take you to church. Even if you don't want to go. Because the Lord's going to get a hold of your heart one way or another. All right, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to... Uh, the watermelon should be out there for eating. And if you are taking part in the uh, eating contest right out front, uh, hopefully you signed up. Make your way out to the, under the carport. And if you all want to watch, you know, the, the fastest two minutes of watermelon eating there ever was then go out there and you can stand around and you can watch. And then we're going to uh, make teams. Remember, 10 and up, they're going to work on blowing up watermelons. And if you've never seen it before, it is going to be a pretty good show. It may take a few minutes because uh, it's a lot of rubber bands. A lot of rubber bands to squeeze a watermelon. But it's going to be a pretty good show when it finally happens. There's watermelon out there. You can eat it while you're waiting. <laughs> so let's, uh, let us pray. Pastor, would you mind... Um, Asking God to bless our watermelon sure. and dismiss us. So. Yes, Father, we thank you because uh, you have blessed us so much. And Lord, we thank you for Brother Daniel, his family. We pray your blessings on Central and Lord on this time together and the fun. And we'll praise you for that too. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs>